five, four, three, three two, two, one. one. <laughs> Thunderbirds are go. We need that. Oh, man, I love it. What's up, everybody? You ready for it? Well, hello. That's right. Well, hello, you guys. We're back. Welcome back to um I got a new I got a new gimmick over here. I got a little this my webcam is also a mic, Mike Manley. Mike Mike Manley. Whoa, whoa, really? Wow. Yeah, yeah so it's kind of like a, I have it over here so I can do some shooting, but I could actually I'm talking into it too, so I hope I sound clear. Yeah, sound good. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Um, welcome all in sundry back to Pencil to Pencil, your favorite pandemic podcast. Now with uh, um, with Biden, <laughs> you beat me to it. <laughs> now with more yeah. Biden. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, um, uh, it was a pretty unprecedented uh, day here in America, uh, and uh, you know what? It was like very presidented. It was I don't, very bro, totally presidented. You know, I don't like talking about politics because there's always somebody who doesn't agree with you. And my, you know, I feel like art is universal. Politics are divisive. But we can all agree that. I think art is pretty divisive. <laughs> yeah. Come on now. We've both been in an art school. Art, art is very divisive. Art is, <laughs> art is politics. Oh, that's interesting. We might have to talk about that. Um, welcome, everybody, to the show. Uh, let's get some hellos in. It's good to see everybody again. I am your humble co-host, Jamar Nicholas, uh, Philadelphia's favorite son, and also the Black Dick Cabot. Welcome. Uh, I am joined by the proverbial hip by my best bud and modern master of comic books, Mike Manley. Um, say hi, Mike. Hi, Jamar. <laughs> Uh, it's always good to see you, Mike. Um, it's good to be seen. It's good to see you. Thank you, thank you. I, I um, I've changed things around. I don't. Did we do the last episode of my new setup? I think we did. I think we did do the last. Or maybe we just did zooming. Uh, yeah, we've been. We have a little like secret cabal group that we uh, see each other over Zoom. But yeah, so um, I changed my background around a little bit. Hey, Matt, how are you? Uh, just to kind of mix it up in 2021, you know, uh, you know, got to keep things invigorated. So sometimes you got to move things around. Um, and speaking of moving around, Mike Manley, um, we have, <laughs> well, hello. Uh, we have a pretty packed calendar coming up uh, for our Wednesday podcast. Um, I think we're almost after our boot camp. I think we're pretty flush until the middle of March. With guests, yeah, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're lining. We we and then we have what two or three more, so we'll probably go to the end of March. Yeah, so we're looking. We're like kissing April, <laughs> and if your name's April, cheer. Brush your teeth. That's right. That's right. Check check your upper lip. My mother used to say that. Some stinks. Check your upper lip. I don't. Oh. I still never really know what that meant, but. Um, so yeah, we're we're kind of lining up a superstar cavalcade of uh, guests, um, and I think you know this just uh, really makes me excited to have this kind of like season two of the podcast. Mike, what do you what have you been thinking about our our talented roster of guests lately? They suck. Worst <laughs> guests ever. Worst <laughs> guests. We need we you know, it's it's so disappointing. Oh, you're so funny. <laughs> we need to just do a good cop, bad cop gimmick. Oh, <laughs> uh, do you good remember guess. what guest, bad guess? We should have two guests. Do you remember back when we first started? And I remember somebody was like, you know what? You guys are too nice to each other. Somebody said that. There should be more conflict on a podcast. That's more interesting. Yeah, uh, but, I, what do what, you want to see like battling? battling artists or something i don't know I, I, th no, I think like we were all agreeable and liked each other and i think i guess it's supposed to be like a i don't know an x factor in the in the in the crew like a curmudgeon dude and then like the happy guy and then you know what i'm saying like well, i'm the, kind of a curmudgeon and you're a happy guy there you go yeah we make it work but i you know i think they kind of wanted to see sparks fly that's like one of those kind of like 
I don't know, like a really? frick, like at a the frick. end of the day, all day I've been working, and now I want to come and have flying sparks. Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got to go to work after that's right. the podcast. Yeah, no, I got to husband my sparks. That's right. Uh, our buddy Matt Rodrigo says, no conflict. We're all over conflict for a while. That's right. Peace in the kingdom. Yeah, yeah. The conflict flew, flew the coop today. So, <laughs> um, uh, JRD, uh, uh, Remarks on your beard, Mike Manley. Says the beard growth growth is looking good, Mike. How are you? Mm, I'm okay. I don't, I'm I'm not sure. I will keep the beard though. Yeah. Yeah. Is this the first time I've had a beard in like maybe twenty years. Yeah, since like back in your Franco Harris days, right? <laughs> back when everybody thought I was uh, George Perez. <laughs> um. Yeah, no, I like the beard because you're you're uh, more of a um, mustache Van Dyke guy. Yeah, uh, I always had a goatee. I've always had some facial hair. Facial hair. Very was a little time in the, I guess the early to mid '80s where I didn't have any facial hair. Mm -hmm. um, and what kind of? Uh, uh, I guess I'm saying, where did the decision for that come from? Like, Laziness. You're you always just kind of, laziness. I was going to say something like that you just feel better with with facial hair, you know what I mean? Or is it just something like, you know, I, I've I've heard that some people grow beards because they have like weak chins. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or they just kind of have like a, you know, like a stork thing going on and they just can't. I think my, chin, my chin is pretty strong. Yeah, you got to, you can take a hit. <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess when you're younger, you think about like, oh, when you're older, you'll be able to grow a beard, right? And so you 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 know like like everybody's got that pedo stash, you know, when you're at in the you're a teenager, right? You know where like it just the peach fuzz just starts to grow in, you know, the, the dirt lip, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, there's always that one guy who's like when he's twelve, he's got like looks like Bluto, you know, he's got like the the full the full beard, but. Uh, Mm -hmm. No, I don't really like to shave. So, you know, if uh, if I grow the, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you're not you're not looking for like the man mountain, you know, like that's a big thing now, like the big bushy, lumberjack beard. Right I'm there. a totally not and never have been a man of fashion, right? Like when I was in high school, punk was really big, and the guys who had the flock of seagulls and all the. <laughs> Like like uh, what's his name on uh, on Cobra Kai, right? There was guys yeah. in Ann Arbor. That seemed to me that that would be as much uh, as like uh, having to do a, as much preparation every day and get as it would be like wearing a suit and a tie to go into an office. You'd have to have the right amount of punk preparedness. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just not a guy who who likes to spend. A lot of times staring in the mirror and well that's that's a new thing guy when i was a teenager guys were not i mean i guess there was the glam okay guys but not a lot i don't remember there being glam people in mm -hmm. high school you know no ziggy stardust um but right. there were people that were punk and people that were hippies had long hair mm -hmm. and well, even with that, Mike, it's it's kind of like if you kind of look at those old uh, San Diego Comic Con pictures from back when it was just like a ballroom with like thirty people in it, like all like all of those guys kind of look pretty dorky for the air, for the age, right? Like the big glasses and like the feathered hair and some bell bottoms, and you know, like there really weren't any like style, you know, like style mavens back then, you know, and comics. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's had like you know, guys like Jack Kirby dressed like my grandpa, right? You know I mean, Stan was more hip, you know. He had, mm -hmm. he had new hair and you know, mm -hmm. new, he had the seventies, uh, mm -hmm. stuff. But uh, yeah, no, I, I, I guess I never, you know, Williamson's generation, guys like Rosetta, those guys were into their, uh, a little bit more into their. Into their, their like appearance, or right? old, you know, greaser or whatever mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think I think that's where we differ a little bit because I'm kind of a fashion dude, 
right? And I'm sure there are people watching will be like, uh, what? <laughs> like, who? Like, as I don't, I don't know what I think people think is fashion. Like, I need to jump out of a car with a gold, you know, a gold lame blazer on with a. Well, you go tiger. into a job every day, or you were going into a job every day, right? So yeah, but yeah, but that I mean, but that that was part of. That wasn't like my whole reason for being like that. I've always liked nice things and nice clothes, but um, I always kind of like cut it short with uh, trends. I don't like trends. I don't, you know, and especially now that I'm older, like I like simple things with not a lot of words on it, you know, unless it's a graphic tee. You know, you know, I'm always matchy. You know, that's my Philly thing. I'm always matching up. And you know all those things kind of that mean probably a lot more to me than a lot of other people. But also, it's it's done me well in my new professional role. Is like say if I have to go do a Zoom with a bunch of students, or if I have to go to the free library in New York and do a panel or something. Well, see, that's different though. That's different if you're presenting or you're teaching. You know what I mean? You're not going to wear sweatpants to teach your class, kind of a thing. You know, although I'm you know or was it um, Patrick Connors, one of my teachers at the academy, say that the average art school teacher looked like an undertaker for cowboys? You know, they're, all, they're all wearing wearing all black, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, I can see that. I can see that. But I, it could be maybe the academic thing too that that you you stumbled on this a good point. Like I, you know, I like yeah. looking like I like looking like a like an adult when I'm on a campus full of uh, students. You know, you should yeah, be able to. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I just think it it, de it it depends upon your maybe your your personality and then where you want to fit in in the the hierarchy. You know, like if you're a painting teacher, you know, you're not going to wear really nice clothes. You don't want to get oil paint right. all over, right? You know. Right, um, right. But of course, back in the day, you see the pictures of guys back in the day, and they would have their. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. They're they're. Uh, <coughs> you all right, bro? They're yeah. <coughs> professorial <coughs> smock. Mm. Went down the to Sunday the pipe. <coughs> we'll take a sec. <coughs> yes, that's the worst, man. Sometimes it just catches you catches you off guard. Well, while Mike gets his gets his deal together, we'll do a shout out to our sponsors. I'm fine. Don't worry about me. <laughs> Take your time, brother. I got you. You know, I, I'll carry you. <laughs> this is funny. Conley says, you said back in the day, and then instant old man cough. <laughs> oh, back oh, in yeah. the day, we That's didn't right. cough. That's right. We just got the consumption and immediately died. <laughs> You got the good stuff. Guys, welcome to Pencil to Pencil, uh, where uh, I want to give a shout out to our sponsors. You know where the John is. Look up. That's You see the John right there? That's right. Pencil <laughs> to Pencil is brought to you every week by our good buddies at Graphicsly who make Clip Studio paint. And you uh, <laughs> <laughs> The cartoon is friend. And if you, uh, maybe you caught it, Mike did a really nice upload to the Pencil to Pencil YouTube channel where you did a, um, a inking. Uh, it wasn't a demo. You were just working, right? And you kind of yeah. Just I just recorded. decided to screen record while I was inking one of the strips. Yeah, it was really cool. And uh, there, there's no shame to our game. We're both the users and uh, users of Clip Studio Paint. And I would say almost like eighty percent of the guests we have on here use it. If, they, if they're about that comic book life. Um, also, a shout out to our good buddy, John Morrow, who is the publisher over at Two Morrows Publishing, the, pub the publisher who uh, takes care of Draw Magazine. Um, and the Kirby so, Collector and, and the, a whole bunch of other. And the Lego Brick, uh, brick. what is it called? Brick Journal. The Lego yeah. Brick and Order Journal. <laughs> And uh, please go to twomars.com and support them. Mike Manley, we don't have a, we don't have a guest tonight, but maybe your Musinex your Musinex goblin moved in. He'll be <laughs> our guest for tonight. Um, but tonight we're going to do uh, a boot camp. That's what? right. But oh man, we'll just leave that up there for two hours. <laughs> 
Everybody can just sort of get into their personal space, stare at the boot camp. That's right. We're we're going to boot camp, you guys. Um, this is some. This is a one of my favorite uh, uh, variants of the show, where uh, Mike and myself uh, talk turkey um, and do a little lesson for you guys live. Um, we encourage you guys to. Um, ask questions or maybe throw some some sauce on what we're doing just uh, uh, to keep it lively. I know, uh, especially I have a little segment, it's going to be kind of hard for me to look at the chat and draw and look at the chat and draw. <coughs> so I'll try, I'll try to keep mine short. And then uh, Mike can always be a little more involved because I can control the, the boards while he's drawing. Oh, no. You do your job, young man. And I'll control the chat. <laughs> mm. uh, so JRD uh, said that was a great little video, Mike. Thanks for posting that. Oh, thanks, JRD. Yeah, it was it was uh, it was fun. It just I'm trying to do more of that now, um, <clears throat> and so I'm trying to work out my how I want to do it. Um, I'm getting another webcam, mm -hmm. but I can also use my uh, iPhone. But then. If you want to talk, you know, like I couldn't really narrate that because I was just doing a screen recording. So, yeah. <clears throat> and then I sped it up like everybody else. So it looks like, wow, look how exciting. It's, he inks something in five minutes. Uh, you need the flight of the bumblebees going on while that's happening. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, those are, those are always really well received. And I, I actually saw Mike from that posting, uh, our numbers, our subs bumped up. So I think you may be on to something. Yeah, I want to do more. I've, I've been wanting to do that uh, for a while. And uh, so I'm going to try to, I don't know if I can do it once a week yet, <clears throat> but I would like to several times a month put up a little tutorial, sort of like what we're going to be doing tonight. You're doing your bit and I'm going to do something on uh, drawing luscious locks of hair. Mm. Um, uh, because there's a lot of stuff up on YouTube and various places, and some of it's very good, and then some of it, I sort of feel like it's sort of smoke and mirrors. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, do you feel like Mike that because um, you know, like we we're our channel isn't dedicated to tutorials, but we like to you know throw that in there once in a while just to you know make sure our pencils are sharp. <laughs> do you think there's a lot of misinformation in people's tutorials like because i because but the before before I, I i let you answer if you look at how people use photoshop for comic books there's a million ways to get to the same result right so it's yeah. hard to say that someone is wrong or they're doing it wrong if you get the results that you need right but i'm sure there's like lazy habits right because i know you're a fan of that like bad habits aren't uh, something to celebrate. So like what kind of like gets your, gets your hankles up in, in somebody's drawing video that you watch? That's, that's an interesting question I have for you. Well, uh, all I can say is from my perspective, <clears throat> I will, I'm a traditional artist who is trying to re replicate my traditional techniques using the digital platform, mm -hmm. right? So all of my skill set is based upon years of traditional pract practice. Mm -hmm. um, I think very often people are coming into it now are coming it in into and using the digital stuff and not really get developing the traditional chops. And so I sort of feel that <clears throat> that is a bit of a the cart before the horse because. Um. There is no command Z in the real world, and you make plenty of mistakes. And part of building your skill is through making mistakes and learning from those mistakes and building upon those mistakes. <clears throat> and I know that the average person, the hobbyist, who's interested in just doing this for fun, it doesn't really matter if they dig beyond a certain level. But if you're going to do this as a as a professional, um, you have to really 
work at a deeper level of understanding. And the reality is, as we were talking to Stephen Silver in our last podcast, is that, like now, okay, now I'm using this 13-inch Wacom, and I'm using Clip Studio. I guarantee you in 10 years, I will not be using this tablet, and I will not be using this version of Clip Studio, or I might not even be using Clip Studio at all. Right. Right? They may, they may be bought out by somebody. Or there may be a whole new new tool, there, you know. Um, so it's kind of dangerous for the younger artists to become so wedded to uh, things that are going to change very often. And all this, of course, is driven by the needs of the studios because the reason why everybody's doing digital is because D Disney goes, I want you to work digital or Nickelodeon or, or whoever. So, mm -hmm. And I think without context, you know, you don't know why somebody is doing that, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't know why they chose this brush. You don't know what kind of effect they're trying to uh, to achieve. Is uh, you're trying to usually emulate digitally something that you could do traditionally. Most people are doing that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> also, there's color spectrum that you work for in print, and then you work for in you know uh, working on the internet or working over you know something that's just going to be on the web. So. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you have to sort of try to explain things, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's, a, here's a trend we could talk about. This is interesting. I don't know if you've seen this. There's this <laughs> new kind of wave of tutorial videos where there's people who go. It's almost like they piggyback of, off of another person's channel, and they go, like, uh, Mike Manley is doing it wrong that's the tight that's the title credit and then they'll kind of go in while somebody else's video is playing and tell you what they how they're doing it wrong you know or you've been drawing anime girls all wrong like it's kind of like almost like an attention grabber and i usually don't stay around long enough to watch the end result of these things but it's kind of like it seems like there's more misinformation where now people are just kind of like chase clout Right, and not even like you know, it's just doing more art. noise, right? It's just more noise. If they were really yeah, a creative yeah. person, they would be creating their own thing, they wouldn't be worrying about what I was doing or you were doing or yeah. somebody else was doing, you know. You'd, you'd be making your own thing, right? Right, rather than, than <laughs> try to figure out a way to write off of somebody else's back. Uh, there's a couple yeah. of things in here, uh, and we'll get started. What up, Bross? Ryan Bross, one of our pencilers, uh, salute. Uh, says, I saw Mike's inking video through his IG story that linked to the IGTV. Then I rewatched it slash watched the whole thing on YouTube on my TV. <laughs> so look at that, man. It travels, right? Everything's yeah, coming I mean, up. Yeah, the other thing that you have to deal with now as an artist is like, okay, I'm going to put it up on my IGTV, on my Instagram, but I'm going to put it on my YouTube, but then I'm going to put it on my Gumroad, then I'm going to put it on uh, Twitter, and then I'm going to put it on my face you know it's like you have like seven places you can put your stuff now but i think what you have to do is really figure out where your where the heart of your audience is right yeah because i'm not a tiktok guy right and i'm not mm -hmm. going to be a tiktok guy because i don't produce what five minutes or three minute or whatever the tiktok thing is right mm -hmm. that doesn't that, that doesn't work for me now some people it, it works for them or was it uh, people are streaming going mm. on over on um, the gaming one? Oh, like Twitch, right? Twitch, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, you could almost go insane trying to split your attention across so many different channels. Mm -hmm. And then I think, I don't know whether it's worth all your, your effort to do that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, hold on. What up, Tim? Tim Fielder. Uh, says Laura Streamyard was kicking my butt. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're learning the platform, bro. Uh, good to see you, man. Um, so, okay, so what I want to do for you guys is I have my other camera rig. I want to talk about some forgotten uh tome before I started uh working with Mike on Draw Magazine. Um, I found this little mail away newsletter. Mike, remember newsletters? 
Remember that thing? Not like you e you signed up for somebody's email and you got an email every week. Like a newsletter was like in the back of some sort of like a penny saver or maybe um, another like heavy metal or something like that. Someone would put ads and just like, you know, check out the, the, the monthly art reader. Well, that's how fandom, comic fandom started with guys in the 60s sort of collecting other people's articles and they'd staple them all together and you know they would make a little newsletter that they would it slowly grew into you know mm -hmm. so like what roy thomas was doing and people like that yeah um that was a little before my time right as um like because you guys were talking about being in the foom and all that other kind of stuff like the all the like the merry marvel societies and stuff like that Yeah, i was never into any of that i think i came along a little bit after, after that, that, after yeah. that. Um, so there's this one. Hold on, I gotta switch the, switch the camera, and hopefully this works out. And oh, before I go, thank you, Steve Conley. You know, middle aged Steve Conley says, "Love the backdrop and lighting, Jamar. Looks great, especially with that Leon Lane sign." Thank you. Just for you, bro. Uh, I'm gonna switch my camera over, and hopefully we'll get this to work. You don't need to see my crotch. Let's try to move this oh, over. Lee, that's your secret technique. That's how you ink. You ink with your crotch. Pencil to the pencil. After, <laughs> pencil to pencil after dark. Uh, so, hey, what's up? What's up? What's up, Mark? Good to see you. All right. So what I wanted to share real quick was, and look, look how old school this is. I kept this in a binder. This and you is, made a little sticker for it. Oh, yeah, this is Cartoonist and Comic Artist Magazine, quote unquote. Um, so this was a newsletter. I, I can't remember. There's only like 13 or something of them. Um, and this may have been, I wish I knew the dates. I think this was from like the mid 90s. Um, and here's the first one. The newsletter for the aspiring... This is kind of like the cartoonist kayfabe guys doing reads. A newsletter for the aspiring comic book animation zine strip. Syndicated freelancer freewheeling cartoonist. Every the everything thing. $3 US. Um, so basically what this was was kind of like a, like a, a affirmation and inspiration newsletter. Uh, and they would do interviews with other creators. Um, I'm not really getting everything in here. I think I can pull this out. Um, have a profile on Sam Hunt. And the first one was um, kind of talking about, there's a little piece on uh, uh, animation. And this is kind of back in the time, Mike, where you, you couldn't really find this kind of information, right? Talking about how to get how to get syndicated. Uh, we talked to Larry Terry White. Pop -Tart. <laughs> right? When's the last time you saw that? And then you can see by the second issue, they start to get some production values. Uh, interview with Sparky um, and Colleen Duran. And there was one thing that I remember talking to you, Mike, because I was going to totally bite it out of this magazine, was they had, let's see if I can find it. Uh, they had one thing where they would have a cartoonist turn in a strip, and it was called How'd You Do That? Right? And How'd You Do That? It would try to de kind of demystify what goes into um, an illustrator doing a job. You know, it's like, what kind of uh, pen did you use? How big was the board? Like, this is great. Like, this was a, a really big book for me when I was learning how to get into self publishing. Lorene, Lorene Haynes getting into the business of comic books. Uh, and there were three of these. I think there was a getting into, a writing, and then she brought them back out as a like a one, one stop shop book. Um, like down here, how to make zines. Huh. Right? It was, it was pretty cool. Go to quick copy. <laughs> That's right. But this is also from that era, Mike, where. I used to tell you that when I started self-publishing, it wasn't a known science yet. And, you know, going to your local Kinko's or something like that, they couldn't help you. They're like, we don't we don't know how to do that. Like, how do you do that? And I, my first book, 
I wound up going to um, a kind of like a web press, like uh, a print, mm -hmm. a, a printer who like did it man press or whatever. Yeah. That did circular circulars for the local area. Shit. Hold on. I just lost the screen. Um, can you still see my, what yeah, I'm doing? Yeah. Yeah, I guess everything so. everything just so that must be around what 91 90 91 somewhere in there well there's a maybe somebody in the room can say because it's there, got uh, it's got a bone and everything too yeah oh yeah you're right you're right that's probably a good thing a good uh, uh marker of time and then this is things that i didn't know mike and this is kind of what i want to get to it's one of the middle issues kind of like you know how to how to fill your uh crow quill with ink Right. These are just things like because I didn't have a Mike Manley laying around when ah. I was trying to learn how to do this stuff. <clears throat> and you kind of needed somebody to either t show you how this stuff works or you just did it by trial and error, you know. Um, and this is, you know, not being a curmudgeon about anything, but it's you think about how easily accessible information is now. Right, where I had to send away for something like this to get info back in the day. And your x-ray specs. Oh, yeah, even better. <laughs> so, and this is interesting. Um, did I freeze? Did you freeze? I don't know. Are you moving your hand? Yeah, shit. <laughs> no, my hand's not even on the, on the paper. Hopefully we can get this back. I might, let me, let me click out and try to click back in. You might have to go to your outside camera. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let me try to go back in. All right. Cool. All right, there you right. go. <laughs> so JRD says, that's funny. Most folks go from peanuts to cherry pop tart, not the other way around. <laughs> so this is interesting right here. I had to use my mouse here. I don't have a lot of space. A glossary guide to comic book terms. What does direct market mean? What does mainstream mean? Novel. Yeah, this is like before everything. Hold on, this is the book selling industry is fooled into thinking the graphic novel is something more than a comic book <laughs> and willingly stock them with their shelves. Man, that's crazy. Here's Sergio. Uh, so what I wanted to get to, this was interesting. It was a good uh, Scott Shaw interview. Is Scott still in a business, Mike? I don't know. You don't uh, really I, you know, I don't. I don't know if he's. I mean, he might still be working in animation. Mm. Um. So one thing that was really interesting, and this is there's like storyboards in here, uh, things that I just wouldn't have known about back at this period of time. Uh, some character designs for Fruity Pebbles ad. And here's here's a here's a, a reproduction of a Fruity Pebble, Pebbles commercial. And while I'm going through this, Mike, how did you how did you learn how to storyboard? How did you pick that up? Uh, well, I think I just number one. I think I was kind of a natural at being able to do it. Um, mm -hmm. From studying animation and, and and reading up on it, and then when they gave me the first um, the first board to work on, Dan Reba was the my director, gave me some pointers like, oh, this is how you indicate screen direction. This is how you do this. This is how you do that. Um, uh, but I think I my brain kind of works like that. Like I see. When I draw a comic, I actually see it as if it was moving, you know, as if it was. Mm -hmm. Your mind's like, eye sees it that yeah, way. Yeah, sees it as, as, a, as a film. And so I think that uh, I was a natural, I think, with being able to do that. And then I just had to learn the technical stuff. And then I learn. And then, of course, then you look at other people's work because they sent me samples of other people's stuff and told me oh you should look at this you should look at this miyazaki thing you should look it over here you should look over there so you know but I, I you know um i think in my experience is that either your brain gets it and mm. or you're a single image person and you can be a great comic book artist and a 
not a very good storyboard artist. And actually one of, I think Brett's talked about this when he was on the podcast before you look at, you see this Alex Toth storyboards mm -hmm. and they're beautifully drawn, but they're not very good storyboards. Yeah. Because they don't really hook up. They don't, they're, they're not film. They're like comic. They're like comics. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things you have to learn is that, Comics and film are two different animals. They share a lot of the same things, but when you're making a cartoon, you're dealing with time and movement, um, and you know you really you you can't have things happen between the panels. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so now we're going into another issue where you can see it starts to get <laughs> it starts to get really polished. There's an interview in here with Jack Davis. But um, I just I kept all these. Like there's probably like I don't know, like ten or eleven of these, and it just sits on my shelf. And I think at one point I scanned these all into PDF, and I I think I I've given one or two of these files to my assistants just so they could read it. I'm I'm sure they didn't read any of this stuff, but you know now in Boring. the but now in the internet, you don't need any of this, right? You've got it all figured out. But what I wanted to talk about real quick was this article that I, I used to copy um, and hand to my students for class. Uh, it's basically on how to use a, a brush for pen and ink. I mean, for uh, uh, inking cartoons. So, uh, sorry for the glare. So one of the interesting thing in, things in here, there are some examples of uh, how line weight varies depending on um, the way you're adding uh, volume to uh, uh, certain curves on the image, right? So this is kind of like a flat image is what you may call like a deadline weight. Uh, Mike, can you kind of explain what a deadline, like how that happened? Or was that more of an animation thing? Because it seemed like comic strip dudes were just kind of, you know, being a little more bouncy with their lines. Uh, well, I guess it's like, yeah, it just depends. I mean, there are people that have a deadline. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's people that have more of a brush thick to thin line. Yeah. Um, and uh, also, I think when you re reduce something and you reduce it down, the uh, thick to thin really helps something have volume on you know a small a small image. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. even in that phantom thing I did. Yeah. You know, the line is the contour lines are bolder because it's being reduced probably like twenty five. Down 25, 30 percent. Right. You know, so you think, oh, that looks pretty bold here, but then you put it in the news, but you always have to be thinking about reproduction. So <laughs> I will start singing a, that line from Grease 2. Reproduction. I saw <laughs> I saw Grease 2 way too many times on HBO back in the day. So this is like one of the first things I really wanted to get into is about how you handle your tool, Mike Manley. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I can't see your face right now. So I'm glad know, I can't see my face. <laughs> you know, to a lot of the people that may be watching, some of our pro friends and other enthusiasts, this might this might be old news to you, but it's a it's a a, a, a learned skill on um, different tools and how you have to change your whole sometimes your whole grip on the tool. <laughs> or even uh, especially a pressure thing. So with a lot of you guys that use digital uh, tools like an eye pencil or a Wacom stylus or something, you may be able to kind of feel that in a, in a different way um, than say you fumbling with a brush or you fumbling with a crow quill. And I wish I could get a raise of hands, but like I'm sure a lot of people when they started out or even right now have tools that they don't use because they're just too hard to figure out, right, Mike? It's like, I, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, cartoons who don't use Crow Quill or pen and ink because they always rip the paper up or it doesn't flow the right way because they might be pulling the line the wrong way. So in this article, they kind of talk about how to vary your line with the brush just by the pressure you're applying to the, the brush itself. Like bearing down produces a heavy line, but lifting away gives you a light line. And that sounds like common sense, right? But in practice, it's a lot harder to master. 
Um, and this is my little favorite part right here where you're given kind of like a little blue line on, and how to practice creating thick and thin line weights. So even uh, if you saw my Instagram a while ago, I found one of those old, um, was it a Statler? Or I can't remember. It was one of the calligraphy pen and ink nib brochures. And it showed all the different nibs and how they work and also how to like apply letters. Like to make an E, you go down and then right, right, right. Right. Yeah. Right. And a G is you do that back circle and then down and then you cross it. So here it's even explained to you, like, how do you create this volume on the edge of the nose? Like you, and this is something that a lot of young students get wrong because they may be in a mode of with a pencil sketching things out. I'm going to, I'm going to sketch this out. And then when you get to the brush, you're using the same technique, like you're using a pencil and you get really jacked up lines. So you almost have to reprogram yourself for inking, right? Where, it's showing right here from A, B, C to D. This is one continuous pull. You start light here and then you bear down and you get light again. Whip, whip, right? Um, and then you also add in, and they don't talk about this in this article, about turning your paper, right? We talk about that stuff a lot. <clears throat> about turning your paper because your arm only rotates so much and your wrist only rotates so much uh, that you're free to move the paper around to kind of, you know, give yourself a break. Uh, so it also has, like I said, this blue line of uh, something that you can kind of print out and work on it yourself. Um, so also, Mike, maybe to uh, to give me a, a little bit of a of a, a relax relaxing session, can you explain about how uh, weight or line weight uh, makes sense on a figure uh, with uh, light sources? Like, why is this thick down here and not somewhere else on the figure? Um, well, there's a couple different ways to approach that. One. In general, if you're doing stuff, especially stuff that's more realistic, mm -hmm. you generally make the line on the bottom of the form heavier and the line on the top of the form lighter to indicate light, you know, the light striking the object. Now, of right. course, this is a this is a flat, right, very flat, you know, 2D uh, image. Uh, but what you're trying to do is you're still trying to give the figure weight so it mm -hmm. looks better. If you put the heavier line weights on the bottom, uh, in in general, and mm -hmm. that's sort of a standard way of doing it. But you have some people who put a heavier heavier uh, outline, uh, uh, constantly doing a thick thin. So you're describing. You could do a thick thin on each one of those globs on the top of his mm -hmm. head, or the, or the egg, or the the. Mm -hmm. uh, as you go around the form, you could accent it by you know, uh, making the line heavier. Um, mm -hmm. But there are other, other cartoonists, again, you know, it's like how you develop your, your language and your aesthetic because each cartoonist ha is operating sort of using their own, developing their own language, usually influenced by, you know, a pre a, 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 an older cartoonist. Like you have the... Um, they call the clear line, line mm -hmm. clear style. Mm -hmm. from people like uh, mm -hmm. Hergé, who did yeah, Tonton, or we mm -hmm. say Tintin. Tonton, Tonton. Or he had a very it's kind of a dead line. Yeah, you know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, somebody like Roy Crane was somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody like Walt Kelly was very much about yeah line yeah. weight and and everything. Uh, Hank Ketchum. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, then you have people like Sergio Aragones who has sort of a kind of a deadline because it's not real thin, thick and thin. It's more of a pen line. Yeah. So there's like a pen line or a brush line. And it really just sort of it's like your taste. What makes sense to you? Um, when I was younger, uh, one of the things I used to do to get good at making strokes, because each each one of those things is supposed to be a stroke. Yeah. I would actually practice making strokes and one of the things i would teach a class would have people 
practice making thin, thick, thin lines, thin, thick, thin, mm -hmm. practice making those strokes. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you move with your elbow, it's different than if you flick with your wrist, right? And different movements is sort of like a martial art. Mm -hmm. um, it becomes muscle memory. So like what you're just doing there, that's muscle memory. <clears throat> so the, the fluidity of your stroke <laughs> comes from practice, right? Just like if you're playing a guitar, right, and then fingering the frets, you know, everybody makes all those sour notes in the beginning because you don't know how to get your finger on the string yeah. on the fretboard or the same way with, you know, playing a piano. It's all about practice. You know, it's, it's, it's simple that, that you say practice makes perfect, but it really that's what it comes comes down to. That's sometimes I think what people miss when they watch a video of something. Because it looks like, oh, you just pick up this tool and then you just, boom, you go. Right. And they don't see, you know, the 10 million lines, the 10 million strokes that I made with a pen or a brush when I was a teenager to try to get a, a good line. And, in fact, it's funny you, to tie into what you were saying earlier. Um, Bruce Tim uses markers. He doesn't mm. use a brush. Or a pen. And I remember the first time, one of the first times we were hanging out back at uh, WonderCon. And he was doing sketches. I said, oh, here. You know, I gave him a brush thing. And he was like, I, I don't. He wasn't feeling it. No, no. And it's like, wow, he has this really, you know, amazing, beautiful work. And he was using markers. So, again, you know, it's it, it really comes down to what you as an artist, what, what you're going for, what do you want? You know, mm -hmm. um, some people like a, a crunchy line, you know, some people like a really smooth line. Some people like things to be very flat. Some guys do pen first and then go back and ac accent everything with a brush. You know, there's like a, a million ways to sort of skin the cat. I think, to me, though, the best thing is to really study the history of cartooning in general, because then you start to discover different artists, you know, that, and they go, oh, I really like how this guy does this. What was he using? Oh, that's a pen, you know, right. that's yeah. a brush. That's, that's a specific type of pen. Like, I remember uh, when I was working with uh, Williamson, he was used a... Hunt 108, and I remember Terry Austin used uh, Hunt 102, and they're both flexible, but the 108 is much more flexible than the 102, and so people seem to sort of break down into using like a gelat. I think uh, Tom Palmer was using his gelats, um, and so it gives everybody gets that. Oh, I want my line to be like this. Right. This pen or this brush gives me that line. And now a lot of people are using markers because the marker technology in the last 20, 25 years has just exploded. I mean, back in the old days, if you used a marker, it was usually your drawing would fade after a couple of years. Yeah. Um, hold on one second. I got to get another tool. Um, so another thing I wanted to talk about real quick, because we talk about these brush these water brushes all the time on the show. Um, and I pulled this one up. I think I have I may have used one of these on the Ashy stream. Um, I went on Amazon and found, usually you get those, what is it, like the Niji water brushes? Um, this was in a, a tin pack of different brush nibs and uh, uh, bristle lengths. Uh, and you can kind of tell this is kind of like a flat. Right. Look at that, right? So I can do these really kind of ill, Ill lines with it. And I kind of like that it's scratchy too. Um, and kind of to what Mike was talking about and just about practice and things, um, it doesn't hurt for you to have a whole pad or a sketchbook that you just fill with lines or you know practicing with the tool just to work on your control. Um, yeah. I, I, I made 
zillions and zillions of sheets of just practicing. And like what I would do is I would look, I would look at a drawing I liked. Uh, let's say like uh, I would look at something that Williamson inked or something that Palmer inked or something that Sinnott inked or something that Dick Giordano inked, right? And so, you know, these guys all had a slightly different type of line. And then I learned things like uh, Giordano would take an exacto root and nick off nice. <laughs> at, at the end of his uh, Windsor Newton at a mm -hmm. slight angle. And that kind of gave him a slight chisel. Like a little chisel. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, um, you know, you, so you learn all those, those little tricks mm -hmm. of the trade and you sort of figure out what you, what you like, you know, um, I'll, I'll be showing some examples of stuff uh, showing the different, different approaches. Also like how thick you like your ink too. Yeah. Right? That affects, that affects the flow of the brush, the thicker the ink, the less it flows. The thinner the ink, the easier it flows. So usually most artists would have a jar for a bottle of ink for their pen and a bottle of ink for their brush. And you usually would leave the bottle of for your brush open and it would slightly evaporate and that would make the ink thicker. And then the bottle of ink for your pen, you would cap up and keep refreshing. And if it got a little bit too thick, you dump that into your brushing because if the ink is too thick, it won't flow off the dip pen. Uh, Mike, there is a couple of questions in the room. Uh, our good buddy Eternity Forever says, should I invest in a Windsor Newton number seven to practice with? You can. I don't think they're as good as they used to be. Um, yeah. I, I uh, you know, a really good brush performs um, above and beyond. But I found that in the last 20 years, the quality of the brushes tend to go down, down, down. Um, and it's funny because even in the 80s, we found some pretty good brushes. There were some Lang Nickel brushes we got in the 80s. And uh, Al said they were as good as the stuff back in the, the old days. But it's hard to find. And I would say since they charge so much money for a uh, Series 7, it yeah. really pays to go into the art store and steal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do the Kirk on the back of somebody's neck. Uh, uh, no, but you got to go in and look at your brush because I've ordered brushes. And then you get some where it's like, what the? This is not very good. This brush got kind of jacked a little bit. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the next question is, um, how, are, how are brush pins compared to a real brush? Hmm. And, and even like, tech, I think technology, again, has gotten a lot better than uh, you would remember the Karataki brush pins you would find in the back of the pearl paint in a in a pine box with like flowers and stuff on it like almost one of these and they were like super expensive and they were really kind of like willowy and you really couldn't get the same kind of line um i think i don't know i think everybody should learn how to ink with a real brush um but i also think that a good brush pen Kind of like even like the Faber Castell pit pins, like those bees, they're pretty good. Yeah, I can't use them; they, they're too mushy. They're oh too yeah, mushy. what would you suggest, Mike? I a, a good brush I, pin. You like um, these, right? Uh, yeah, they're okay. They're okay. What I what I found is is that you have to use a Coronor rapidograph ink. Oh, <laughs> what's that? Um, because that will not gunk up the um water brush the uh yeah if you use the regular that has an acrylic binder in it it will gunk up your water your uh you know any of those uh pentel pens mm -hmm. and eventually you'll just have to throw it out because you won't be able to clean it, it will, eventually the hairs will just start to split on it even if you wash it it just it just eats up the hair it just it just because it's acrylic binding with acrylic yeah. Um, and, you know, it's funny. I picked up when I 
Oh, I didn't show you. The, I didn't show you my pickup. You didn't see my uh, my come up. Look at that. Isn't that crazy? This whole set, and these are all different brushes. Hey, you haven't tried them all yet, right? No, I'm I'm on like one and two. This set was like twelve bucks, and they're pretty. They're pretty big. Like these are like a big size. Like I don't know the sizes, but this is like a. There's a lot of volume in there. Um, this is this may be a little bit of overkill, but I figured you know you, it's always good to practice. Um, and the reason that I think Mike and I and a lot of other cartoonists use this little trick is that it's kind of a little bit of a, a time saver, a little bit of an art hack, especially if you're doing like the volume of work that Mike does, where you may not have time to keep going back to the well and dipping your brush in a brush in for more ink, right, Mike? You can kind of just keep moving. Yeah, yeah. I mean, now I'm doing everything digitally. Yeah, because of the pandemic. But um, again, you know what might work for me or my. I think we lost them. Sorry about the glare, guys. I'm trying to find out. That's a little better. What you um, say, your mileage may vary. What may work yeah, for you? Yeah, I mean, what you really have to do is you have to buy this stuff and you have to try it out. You have to try out a 108. Pinpoint or a 303 or whatever, because the kind of line or the kind of feel that you're going for may be very different from the one that I am going for or yeah. you're going for. So I think you really, you know, you have to buy the stuff, you have to experiment with it, you have to try, you have to practice. I mean, it's the same way if you're, you're doing watercolor or you're doing gouache or you're doing, you know, there's certain oils that certain oil painters, oil paints. And they like certain kinds of brush. Some people like filberts or, or whatever. You know, it's not one size fits fits all. You know, I mean, I can work with anything now. You know what I mean? I can try to make it work the way that I want because what I like. Right. So I'm inking digitally now. Right. And I'm using a stylus, which is does not give me anything near the kind of feedback that a traditional brush does on a piece of you know bristol mm -hmm. everything is like inking on a sheet of glass so i have to mimic my line or the type of line that i want which means that i have to actually kind of build it because it does not naturally happen all the time right where if i'm using a traditional tool i know okay if i use this kind of ink and i use the, you know if I want a, a dry brush, I have to select something that gives me a certain type of dry brush, right? And there might be three or four, right? I don't do that when I'm doing traditional stuff. I just make a dry brush. You know, right. I don't the ink is this way, and I have only have so much on the on the on the on the brush, and I, I know it. So if I'm doing it in Clip Studio, and they have like a, I mean, there's like millions of brushes. I still use the same two 99% of the time. <laughs> right, right. You know I mean, because you can't really, you can't really tell, you know. Uh, if I use traditional tools, I can tell yeah. because I can feel it. I can actually feel the difference between uh, Faber, Eberhard, uh, School Nib, yeah. or uh, Hunt 108, or Gelat. Or a, a, a 102 or a 101, you know, a mapping point. I mean, there's a lot, I have tons of different types of pen points, and I can choose one because I, I like the kind of line it makes, and I know how that feels when I do it. I don't get that when I do it digitally, right? Yeah. I don't get the, there's no feel, it's all the same feel. So I'm having to craft it based upon my experience, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I, I always advise. The young artists to get as good as possible with the traditional tools because then when you work digitally you'll know how it feels and what you want much much better yeah thank you mike that was great advice <laughs> so um yeah so i wanted to oh i have a couple other like art shows i'm just all over the place with this um and if anybody was paying attention while I was kind of noodling around with this brush pen, is that my grip on the on the tool 
<laughs> changed every almost at every time I used it, right? So it's kind of like you really don't want to fight your supplies. Um, you know, if an angle doesn't work with the way your body works, then change it. Move the paper, turn the paper. Get rid of that. <clears throat> um, and if you ever kind of like marvel at people who have this really interesting line weights, they're just kind of making making the paper do what I mean, making the tool do what it needs to do for them. Like you, it's not. I, you know what? I don't know. I've seen people use really shitty supplies and get really good results. I wouldn't tell anybody that it doesn't matter because it does to a degree, but. You know, it's one of those things we might you would talk about the magic pencil, right? You know, people say, what What was that pen did you use? What was that? What? What's the name of that brush? Like some of that really doesn't matter, you know, at the end of the day, because like you said, you name like five or six different cartoonists who all have a different line, you know? Right. I think you tend to find that cartoony people use a more of a brush now you if you go onto youtube as an example and you look up a lot of the manga artists right a lot of those guys are using markers right mm -hmm. and they're working on a very thin almost like a one ply paper right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're working on a light box where they send to rough the stuff out and then do another drawing and then they do maybe even a cleanup drawing on top of that um where we tend to do this where you're working with the color erase pencil and then tighten mm -hmm. it up with a regular pencil yeah. and then ink it. They're working on a light box um, yeah, and, they, right. and they're because, it, you know, and they're using markers, you know, a lot of the old school guys were probably using, using pens. And again, you know, there's not one is not necessarily better than the other. It's just like what you want. You know, you, I would just in general say if it's not waterproof, and it's not permanent ink, don't use it because your work will disappear. One of the things I've done very often in class is I will take the uh, student down and show the, and go to, there was a blick in the, in the school and I would take him in and go like, this is a good thing to use. This is not a good thing to use. You know, don't, don't ink anything with a Sharpie. Right. 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 You, oh, write, right. You, write, you write living room on a box with a Sharpie. Or the address on an envelope, but you don't do any meaningful artwork with a sharpie because it's going to disappear. It's going to change. It's going to the ink's going to spread and change to like weird colors. Right. And, and uh, you know, and, and the you know, person doesn't know that they're just like I'm just inking. I'm just making out. Right. And they're cheap, you know. Um. So I just showed you real quick. These are something, a couple of new tools I picked up for uh, to work on Leon with, as I've been really enjoying this kind of flexible pen. Uh, this is a Pentel Stylo uh, pen. I tried to show it up to the camera earlier. It was kind of hard to focus. It's got a really kind of like weird flexy way. Yeah, I've seen I've seen those type of pen points before. Yeah, but is that permanent ink or not? I think so. <laughs> I think it's permanent. Um, but what I liked about these, because I bought a couple of these like two summers ago, and I really enjoyed it. And I was like, well, shit, I, I think I've killed this nib. And then I found out that they're refillable. They're not actually refillable. You, you can change. You can buy more pens and then just like dump it back in the barrel. So really, this is the only thing that you're refilling. So they're kind of disposable, but you can kind of use the same vessel, kind of like a like the penguin cigarette holder. <laughs> oh, okay. But you know, I really enjoyed enjoyed the line. I just started this one. It's probably not the best one. Um, which can be a little flexible, and like you were saying, it has a little bit of an edge to it, a little bit of a of a wedge. And one thing that I've been learning for a while is varying my line. Like, Mike, you, you know, especially when we first met, I used to have a really thick line. 
almost like a graffiti line. Yeah, it was kind of it was really like a graffiti line. And it it took a lot for me to learn to vary that and even kind of like kind of ease back off of how hard I was pressing on things and kind of find some love inside of, of a thin line. Right. So using a tool like this is kind of making me, you know, work thinner, so to speak. And then what I'll do if I feel like something, you know, needs a little bit more bounce, like I'll go back over it with a brush. You see how I kind of did that for this drawing that was here already. Um, that's a that's a little heavy handed. I probably wouldn't do that on kind of like finished work. But, you know, it's really, you know, think about what you're doing that you don't have to use the same tool for everything. You know, you can go at a attack a drawing with maybe three pins and a brush. Right. Like maybe I'm going to do this whole thing with a bunch of number three um, microns and then I'm going to finish it with this with this brush. Right. Or, um, you know, I've seen, you know, people like uh, Mobius do everything with one pen or yeah. my buddy Ricardo Villagran inks everything with a brush, but you would think that he was using a pen. <laughs> right. Amazing control. He could, he could get ink everything with a brush. And mm. some of those old school guys like uh, Salinas and people like that, the guy used to do the Cisco kit, those guys could do everything with a brush. Just amazing skill. So, yeah. again... What it really comes down to is time and practice give you the skill with your tool. You could be any tool, pen or a brush, but to really become a to really become a master, you have to really put the time in to practice it. So you get you get to, you know, express the line the way that you want it to feel. You know, you can look at somebody like Mobius. When he was doing Lieutenant Blueberry, it was much more of a brush style. And when then he was doing the Mobius stuff, it was much more of a pen style. And occasionally he would mix them a little bit, you know, a little bit of pen and brush. But um, again, it's it all it's all about you achieving the look that you want, so that you can't really do that without trying a bunch of different pens, you know, yeah. a bunch of different brushes, yeah. you know. Uh, I always, you know, it's always uh, a scary thing for people at the beginning who just inked everything with a Pigma and then yeah. you give them a brush and they're like, oh my God, how do you use this thing? You know, and they would sit there literally, I've seen it, you know, where they would sit there and there would be a large area of black on their drawing, which they would just fill in with like a eight uh, uh, a Pigma, just, you know, not using a, a brush like you are to fill a big area they would fill that whole area with like a thousand <laughs> little strokes and that's like no nah, it's not very efficient right um all right i want to hand almost hand this over to you but uh one thing that i was thinking about was kind of like um the mystery of hatching and cross hatching um and i remember uh, especially when i would teach my young students when i would ask them to fill in an area or hatch something they would almost for lack of a better word just scribble like, and if you've ever looked at, I don't know, uh, an ink Marvel drawing or something, every one of those lines, even a laborious drawing, has very precise strokes, right? I'm just making lines on this paper. Sorry for the glare, right? Um, and all of this stuff I've done, and this I'm just dicking around. You never saw me go like that. <laughs> right? I wasn't going, blah, 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 blah. there you go, right? So... Every one, of, every one of my lines is has a purpose. Has a purpose, and I've I said on one of my things on Patreon, I'm getting used to working in silence, Mike, because I'm enjoying hearing that whip, 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 whip. That's a very uh, meditative process. Inking, I find. Um, this is like inking. right. Like this is like practicing your scales. It's just like yeah. bang, 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 you know. And it's all control. And I hate rulers. Mike knows this. I hate doing kind of like structured drawings. I, everything's organic. Even on some of my comment pages, say I would maybe rule it out with a um, 
ruler, like if I was doing a panel border, I'd rule it out with the ruler to make sure it's straight, and then I would ink it freehand, just because I just don't like the way things look if they're too mechanical. Right. Just to kind of give it a natural, sh a natural look. Uh, so, all right, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, I'll let the uh, Master Chief back to back ah. to the, the show. Um, I hope you guys got something out of that. Uh, I think on my next one, we'll probably do something a little more structured. Um, but uh, I had talked to Mike before the episode, and Mike was like, I don't know, what do you want to do? And I was like, Mike, you could, you should talk about hair. You should do a tutorial on hair because I think hair is one of those things that is like a cartoonist mystery. Like some people are really good at doing hair, like women's hair and things like that. And some people just never get the hang of it. So I was hoping that Mike would want to take a stab at doing a hair, a hair tutorial. Hair today, gone tomorrow. And guys, uh, let me, let us know what you think of the episode so far. Appreciate it. Get, get my rig set up here. And I'll go back through some of the comments while you're doing that. Um, Ray Felix says, you make that look effortless. Thank you, Ray Felix. I appreciate you. Eternity says, what about a Kung Fu grip? Will that work? Well, there's some people that hold their their, their art supplies like, like a claw. But, you know, I think that kind of takes life off of your hand like if you have a claw grip especially if you hand letter like at some point you're going to have to give that up um and you know if you're like doing like ah ah after you're finished with the page you're probably holding the, the tool too hard mark robinson says he's drawing an editorial cartoon while listening thanks man i love i love the hands i love your cart here they're almost like milk coal hands that's good stuff mark uh, second, my rig is giving me a hard time. For a second. Sure, sure. I, you know, I can, I can fill a silence. Matt Ringo says, "Loving it." I have a pin fetish, so this is so good. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. And everything I got was off of Amazon. Uh, JRD said in the chat a second ago, "Jet pins is a great resource." I broke. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this on blast. I broke jet pins in Draw Magazine years ago, where I did a crusty critic article, and I was like, "Yo, real rap." Jetpins.com is, is what's up. So I'm glad to see that they're thriving and they have they have a really great selection. So give them your money. <laughs> yeah, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Wear that, wear that flair. What's up, Jamal? How you doing? Um, yeah, like I said, I hope you guys are enjoying this. Uh, JRD says, I'm legit watching two different streams at once, but love watching you ink, JN. Thank you so much, JRD. Appreciate that. Um, anybody else have any art supply questions while, while Mike's getting set up? Oh, and Mike, uh, Eternity says, Neil Adams' advice is to use the shoulder and not the wrist. Could you speak about why the shoulder is better than the wrist? We covered that a little bit, but uh, if Mike wants to get to that, he can answer. Oh, almost. Mm -hmm. Well, I can, I can, I can touch on that eternity. And uh, really, one of the things is your kind of like the whole rhythm of a drawing is predicated by how you're using your body in it, right? It's something you don't really think about, but if you think about like a boxer who learns how to strike more effectively by like putting his, it's like a, it's like a momentum force thing. You putting, putting your weight into it, shifting your feet, like. You know, it's almost like key and all and chi and all that stuff. Um, it might be a little too spiritual for drawing lines, but um, I th think if you're drawing from your wrist, you're you have a more limited range of motion than drawing from your shoulder, right? So even when I was doing those circles on a page, I was kind of using my whole arm rather than just doing tiny little things and kind of like 
uh, reducing my own energy, if that makes sense. Um, there's probably more scientific terms, but if you ever watched old film of cartoonist drawing, like I remember seeing a bunch, of, they probably took them down on YouTube. They had a bunch of old videos of a bunch of cartoonists in front of a giant white piece of paper, and they were doing kind of like jams or narrative corpse uh, um, exercises. It's basically like a cartoonist jam session. And you saw a lot of them, if they were kind of using a pen, they would do very labored, calculated, almost mathematical strokes. But if they're using a pencil, they were doing like, if you've ever seen a Charles Schultz, Charlie Brown sketch, he just kind of like whips it through, almost like he's whipping a car. Um, and I guess that what I'm saying is kind of talks more to changing your mindset of using a pencil versus using a brush or using a marker versus using a pencil. I used to tell my young students that even the beginning of learning how to sketch is how hard you, you grip the pencil like your claw thing. But also, if you try to draw the same way you would write a letter, um, you can tell, like, say, if anybody writes cursive anymore. Dear mom, had fun at sleepaway camp. I got rickets, though. Send... <laughs> Sid ointment, love Jamar. You can tell that you're doing very labored, tiny loops and strokes while you're, and it's almost like you're thinking, you're bearing down on the paper. Uh, there's a lot of things that go into you just writing, right? But then when you're sketching, you can't bring that same technique to the pencil. You have to almost have a lighter touch on it. And I kind of freak people out when I, when I do sketches because they're so light because I'm totally changing the, the, the pressure I'm applying to the pencil. So I want it to be light. And then you also think about how you hold the pencil. Like you can get like a million different point, uh, uh, lines off of something like this if you hold it lightly on an angle to use the broad side of it or if you hold it up top and do very kind of like belabored strokes with the grip higher up on the on the pencil that changes things like if you've ever inked foliage or something in the background of a, of a comic like a like a shrub rather than drawing these little tiny things these tiny like loop loop shrub 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 i would hold the pencil up higher and kind of just like let it let it carry me if that makes sense um I hope, I hope Mike came back. <laughs> you guys like that? Jamal says, what's the first thing to do when you're starting to use Clip Studio Paint for comic book creation? I think the first thing you have to do is... Uh, Mike, Mike disappeared. Hopefully he'll come back. I think what the first thing you have to do is kind of tell yourself that it's not Photoshop, right? That's kind of flummoxed a lot of people uh, when they first start using Clip because the things that you're used to doing in Photoshop don't work exactly the same way. Um, I think the easiest thing to do is just find a project to work on or a page and just figure out how to make stuff work. It's like, okay, I'm going to do a, a four panel strip. How do I make the borders? How do I make the panels? Okay, there's a marquee tool, but that's not doing what I wanted to do. That's making, you know, that's turning everything into a mask. Wait a minute, no, 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 that's not it. Well, how do I how do I figure out these 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 pins? They call the ink lines pins. Like, is this a G nib? Is this like kind of like a turnip pin? How does that change? Some of that stuff will depend on what kind of vessel this is coming through. Like, if you're drawing on a Cintiq, you might have more or less. Uh, uh, you might have a variance in how the tool is responding if you're using an Apple iPen, iPencil versus a Wacom stylus on a on a Intuos 6, if that makes sense. Um, I think the next thing is important is figuring out your, 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 your workflow, um, making sure that you have everything in a place that you can reach for it um, is important. I think uh, Mike's back. 
I think really the best thing you can do is just start practicing um, and figuring out how all of the tools work. But I think kind of separating the idea that this is Photoshop all in one place uh, messes a lot of people up. Mike, the question, Mike, the question was, how would you tell somebody to start using Clip Studio Paint for comics? And did you have any stumbling blocks when you switched over to it? Because you said you used, used Photoshop a little bit when you were doing some stuff, right? Oh, I've used Photoshop for years, decades. Right. So, but it's not clip. It's not clip, though. No, it doesn't have perform as good as clip does. So, um, I mean, like anything else, you just have to start trying to draw your comic. You have to figure out how you want to do it. There's, there is, there is no, you know, I'm doing it the way that works for me to be able to produce the strips the way that are as close to the way I normally work. All right. So, but somebody, you know, coming along, um, you know, I may want to draw on it, may not want to draw, may only want to ink on it. Um, you know, the, mm, uh, right, right. Um, so just bear with me here. I'm having to get everything. Yeah. Now that was a good point. Like, what are you using it for? Are you doing whole hog comic book creation? Are you just using it for the inking tools? Because the inking's dope in Clip Studio Paint. That's one of my favorite parts of it. Um, and I always felt like inking in Photoshop was like a, a labor and frustration. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of it kind of is. Um, you know, I would say that... Um, but again, you know, it depends upon what you want. And the only way you can know if any of this is going to work for you and how it works for you is to actually do it. Yeah. You know, you can't, they're, they're, I mean, it sounds silly, but I mean, basically that's what it boils <laughs> down to. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you have to be able to do it yourself, you know. Right. So, uh, Mikey, are you ready or do you want me? Yeah, can... just a second. Uh, one thing that is always a, a, a good practice thing is like either draw something yourself or find some line art online and convert it to blue lines. Or you can even find blue line drawings on, on uh, Google Images really easily. Figure out how to bring that into into Clip Studio Paint because that's a process in itself. Uh, how are you, you know, place that into your into your document and then try to ink it. Like figure out how to work with the opacities, figure out how the layers work in this way. Um, and also, there's a, something that's really not the same in Photoshop is that you can create raster or vector layers. Right. So figure out what your end result is and, you know, play around with that stuff. And probably after two or three of the things, you'll get the hang of it. Okay. So here, let me get back to, yeah, I think my, uh, everything got locked up. Uh, yeah. It's one of the things that happens when you have like your Photoshop open or your other thing open in the stream yard open. After a while, the computer goes, no man, I don't <laughs> like any. I don't like any of this. It's it's all it's all gonna get get shut down. Um, yeah. Um. So I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. All right. Um. I don't see it yet. Oh, here it comes. All so, right. uh, since you asked about the um, doing hair, drawing hair. Um, I did do an article on it in uh, Draw Magazine 21, which, again, you can get uh, every issue of Draw is available at tomorrows.com as a PDF, and they're pretty cheap. I think they're only like 3 or $4, something like that. So, um, But anyway, I will sh sh show, uh, show you some excerpts from this. From this article, um, and basically, what we're talking about again is form and um, how form is 3D form is represented on a 2D surface, right? So, um, 
And there's a lot of different ways of drawing a cartoon, drawing an image. You can do something that's very realistic. You can do something that's very super cartoony. Um, one of the things I always like to do is to try to put everything in context for people. Um, and um, there's a lot of different types of cartooning. Um, let's see here where did I get them all in here. Um, so when you start, you can look at somebody like the old cartoons. Mm, a little, little right? chick young. Love right? it. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he started out, you know, in the, in the, the, the I believe in the twenties with his, because mm -hmm. she sort of had this flapper style. Mm -hmm. But the thing about the hair in these early cartoons was that it was a very identifiable shape, right? Mm -hmm. And then most of these characters are drawn to look good. No, this is good. <laughs> maybe, maybe very I'll, graphic. They, very uh, graphic. You, uh, Mike, you froze for a second. You said uh, they're drawn to look good and and what and and. And they're drawn to good look in very specific views, like mm -hmm. the back view, three quarter view, right, mm -hmm. and the the side view, and the hair, these very interesting little, little swirly cur curly yeah. patterns. All right, yeah. now, yeah. right, um, this kind of cartooning, which they call Bigfoot cartooning. Mm -hmm really influenced the anime and the manga artists, right? Because a lot of the same thing, the faces are designed to look good from certain angles, mm -hmm. right? The shape of the hair, right? Each character, this is uh, Inuyasha, each character has very identifiable hair. Yeah. Right? And the faces are designed, are kind of like masks. Right. I was thinking a lot of the anime thing, right? Um, so you can see all the hair is designed to read, you know, how many spikes you have, right? Whether it's white, whether it's, it's, it's black. It's all shapes, nice, clear, simple, identifiable shapes. And you tend to draw. One thing about manga and anime the same thing. You tend to draw the faces from the three-quarter view very, yeah. very, very often. Yeah. Um, one of the things here. So this is Gunsmith Cats. This is the anime. I love Gunsmith Cats. All right. <laughs> yeah, Sonata. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Mm -hmm. This is the comic. Yeah. So the comic is a little bit more detailed as far as the rendering, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. but what do you see? Three quarter, three quarter, three. So the hair is designed to look good as a shape from these basic views, right? Even though when they take it into animation, they have to simplify it. And then what they do is they create what we call sort of the crown, mm -hmm. that, that highlight of light yeah. going across. Mm -hmm almost like where the crown would be. So that's like the crown lighting. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you see that very often in, in anime. Now, here's a much more realistic style. Uh, this is by Leonard Starr, who was one of the premier comic strip soap opera artists, and one of my favorites. This, by the way, is all brush. Mm -hmm. All right. But you can see... That same idea, the crown, the, where the mm -hmm. bands of light going across, right? And this is Stan Drake, another one of the great, the guy who's probably the major influence on Neil Adams, right? And so, mm -hmm. again, a very illustrative style, yeah. but the same idea of how you light the head, right? And he had a very loose, mm -hmm. open, very, uh, this is all pen. Yeah. A Gelat 290, I believe, is the same one that Neil Adams inked with. Um, 
And so much more illustrative, very actually very similar to um, coming out of the uh, school of people like uh, Charles Dana Gibson, who I had here, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can see the same thing, the highlight or the crown, right? Mm -hmm. That's all pen. Yeah. It's all pen. And it's very painterly, very, very, very t tonal. Um, so you start out and you think also of the head as a ball, but not as more as a sphere with the hair. And the hair you lay in is sort of like overlapping strands or chunks that layers over the form underneath. So you think of it as, as laying on pieces, right? Mm -hmm. And this is sort of like an anime, little anime head. And so you have the light source, and so you have the peak here, and then you have another peak. So it's like waves. So you right. indicate the light going top of the form, down, then back up, and then down. And usually you have two highlights, this sort of standard. Sometimes yeah. you may have more. I'll show you guys some funny stuff. Um, hair comes out and flows over and goes down. It's affected by gravity. It's mm -hmm. also affected by the coarseness of the hair. Um, and it flows down over the, the skull, you know. Mm -hmm. um, shorter hair might curl. Longer hair tends to have these longer flowing shapes. It's also about design. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see the pattern. If you look at somebody like, um, uh, so here's Hal Foster, guy who did Prince Valiant, right? Very much like the Charles Donna Gibson, but you can still see the same principle. There's a dark highlight. So you see the wave, you can see the wave. So with the right in the middle of the, the peak of the of the curve, that's where the highlight is. Mm, mm -hmm. You know, but then you hear see another much more graphic use of line to indicate hair. So look at here, like he's indicating a lot of different types of hair, right? Long hair, short hair, men's hair. But it's a different kind of, but he's still finding that pattern of light going across the form. Uh, Leindecker, great, great illustrator from the beginning of the last century, the huge influence on Rockwell. Again, the same, you can see the wave idea of the hair and the form. Very beautifully stylized how he stylize the light on all those curls. Wow, um, that's that's fantastic. Alphonse Mucha. Mm -hmm. A lot of people like Mucha, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, big influence on people like uh, Adam Hughes and Amzell and, mm -hmm. and a lot of modern artists. Again, just beautiful design, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, 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 you... Oh, sorry, go ahead. You know, go ahead. Uh, like I think maybe one of the strongest Muka influences in modern time is, is Casada brought a lot of that to his yeah. Marvel work. Yeah, right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, another guy was great with hair was Frazetta. Mm -hmm. He was great with shape, right? So you have shape, um, and here's some of his his love comics. Um, again, you can see the band, the two bands, right? And you can see the same thing here with the curls. Um, he's one of the best inkers of hair. So one of the one of the things that that you know I did, Brett did, most guys did, is they would go through and they would actually copy. Because again, it's another thing to it's one thing to look at it and go, okay, yes, I see that. It's another thing to copy it for for studying. So here's some more um, uh, Charles Donna Gibson. So you can see the same concept of how to light the hair, mm -hmm. right? 
Mm -hmm. Rosetta's almost all brush, right? Um, this is probably mostly brush, maybe some pen. Um, and this, of course, these are oil paintings, but it's the same mm -hmm. principles. Um, Mobius. <laughs> And then, of course, Alex Raymond. Again, just look at the beautiful. You can really see some guys really, they really have that whole highlight down. Um, it's really almost like a little bit. Now, you could do this very graphically and take out all the feathering, and it would mm -hmm. still be, right? Right. Right. <laughs> That's a nice one. Like Russell Patterson again, very flat, very graphic, no rendering, shape. And here's some drawings by Brett. <laughs> That's great. And then when you're working in animation, I very often you don't have. You can't really put a lot of rendering, so you have to really deal with the shape and the design, which would go back into what you get with uh, Muka. And here's some Judge Parker stuff where I'm doing the same thing. So usually, what I do, um, oh, I was going to show you this this fun stuff. So um, close that window. Um, and there's a couple different schools, right? So in America comics, you sort of had the Bigfoot stuff, like the Blondie, mm -hmm. then you had the Kniff school, yeah, which uh, was mostly brush. So this is um, Frank Robbins, mm -hmm. um, and you can see the same concept as we were looking at, but he's using the brush, mm -hmm. right? And so his stuff is much bolder it's more abstract right it's the same idea there's a half tone so like if you're inking somebody who's a blonde got blonde hair mm -hmm. uh, some people would do the half tone like that here's a great piece by Frazetta mm -hmm. you know and the one thing that's interesting about Frazetta stuff as he very consciously inked each one of these lines, not even, mm -hmm. right? He staggered it, which gives it much more of an organic flow. His, yeah. ink, his ink was also very thin. Mm -hmm. But look how beautiful all these S shapes are. Yeah. Right? It's very, very, oh. kin very kinetic. Right, right. So he's like one of the best... Again, here, beautiful, just shape. He could break it down to where he was just doing almost like the shape of the girl's hair. And then the lines, kind of like Muka, the lines going along mm -hmm. the shape, the direction of the shape. Right? Mm -hmm. So it really becomes design. And he did that quite a bit, right? So that's that's his more traditional stuff that he did coming from uh, when he was doing his Johnny Comet strip. And mm -hmm. this is work about 30 years later, 20 years later. And it, his work became much stronger in its sense of design. Mm. So you have the Bigfoot cartoony or like the Patterson, the flat style. And then you have somewhere that's in between where it's rendering, but it's also design, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still expressing these uh, same principles. Um, and when I do Judge Parker, which is a classic newspaper soap opera, I'm following in the same sort of classical, I do it in a classical style. So I render the hair very, classically right i'm not trying to do it very 
designy per se, like uh, like uh, Muka. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm trying to do it more in the 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 tradition of people like uh, Raymond or Leonard Starr. Um, you know, so here, you know, if you're doing somebody who has lighter hair, maybe you don't do any middle value rendering. Maybe if she was a redhead, I would put a little bit more middle value rendering. Um, and so I thought I'd show you some really awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what I would recommend <coughs> people do. To practice, <laughs> to not only um, copy some of these great artists, but also find photos like this, mm-hmm. especially black and white photos, because yeah. it really breaks it down. You can really see the pattern of light going across the form. Yeah, you know, you can really see the crown. What we call the crown lighting. Mm-hmm. Okay, you can see one. Two, right? right? Really, one, two. At the top of each curl, boom, boom, boom. But that goes across this plane, right? Mm-hmm. And one of the things to make the hair f- feel like it's not just r- random is you have to really sort of map it out going across the plane, right? So mm-hmm. even if you do, this is Robert Ripper, but even if you break it up, you can still see, right, that same banding. Now, the great thing about looking at old Hollywood photos is that th- they had people whose entire job it was to light this hair so you could see the hairstyle. You could see the form of the hair. Right. Right. So these are great to, to copy because you can really see, you know, you can really see the, the lighting on the, uh, on the form. Uh, here's a few more, um, <laughs> you know. So the classic strip guys and the illustrators back in the day were looking at photos like this, right? And just look how beautifully, you know, they spent a lot of time to get her hair right. And yeah. then they spent a lot of time. There was these guys in Hollywood who, who all they did was shoot glamour shots, right? And they learned how to bounce the light and fill the light and have a, a hard light and a soft light. So if you notice as you go down the form, it gets softer. But you right. can still see the top of each curl, the highlight. So I think it's great to find these old photographs and to do studies from them because they are so clearly illustrate the light and the, and the, yeah. uh, and the shadow. Um, yeah. um, so I thought what I would do is I would um, do a little, a little demo. Okay. Um, to sort of explain in a little bit more detail the uh, the head. Now, one of the things about the head, the head is not round. People tend to draw, you know, like a round head. The head is not the head is not, is not round. Mm-hmm. The only part of the head that's actually round is the top of the skull, the cranium. Right, that's the only part that's round. The rest of the head is really sort of a a wedge shape. And thanks everybody for uh, hanging out with us tonight. We're here every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Tell your friends. So um, the other thing about drawing hair is figuring out how the hair maps onto the head. So in general, you have your hair. You have a point here, point here. 
And then you have your temple, right? Mm -hmm. Even on a woman, right? You have you you have the hair, right? And then it would go down. So the hair would come. You have to figure out how high up on the hair, on the head. But you generally have these little points. One, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. You know, or like me, I only have no points. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, so the hair comes out of this. So if I was going to draw, let's say, um, Abby from Judge Parker, mm -hmm. right? Her hair comes, comes, um, and since I have to draw those characters very, very consistently, I, I'm very, I, I know exactly like how the hair comes out. So the hair, her hair starts out and comes down like a, there's an S for her bangs, right? Because she's sort of got like hair, almost like a character from Dallas, right? So then it comes out here, down. Then another band comes down underneath. And then another band comes down. So you have to sort of think like you're layering this on, right? Mm hmm And the hair doesn't rest right on the skull. The hair is over the top of the skull. Right. So the it's best high. thing to do, right? So the best thing to do is to draw these little guidelines. So she sort of has. I sort of base her a little bit on Morgan Fairchild. So you have <laughs> all those characters from all those old sitcoms, right. like Dallas and stuff. The hair is really blown out. Right. They get a lot of volume. So. <laughs> Morgan yeah. Fairchild, whom I've seen naked. <laughs> I think we've all seen her naked. <laughs> that's that's from Saturday Night Live, for anybody that doesn't know where that's from. <laughs> right. And, it's, and one of the, I guess, the, the tips for somebody who's not used to doing this, like you said, is raising the hair up off of the skull. You're right. Right. Yeah, that's... That's a great takeaway. Okay. So basically whenever I'm drawing her, this is how I start. I draw, draw the, the head underneath. You know, you got to figure out where her ear is, you know. So now I'll be right back, Mike. You're good. Keep going. And you design the hair. You try to make it always appealing. Um, so if I was penciling this, this is how I would sort of block the hair in. Then what I would do is once that was done, I would go back in and what we call the Put put in what we call the crown, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like if you had a queen, right? They would have a crown. So usually there's lighting goes right across here. If the light's coming down, you have to always, of course, figure out where your lighting comes in because that affects this. So you would have this. That would be the 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 highlight as it rolled over and you go down and then maybe you would down here as a hair would come back up you would have another so in anime they would do this right they would they usually have that one it's a right. very simple anime thing right now right. In, in this case if i'm drawing something that's more you know again it, the if it's cartoony you might simplify that by doing that 
highlight and might not even have a line and just might be the highlight of the, the break of a color line there. Right. 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 Um, but if I'm not, if I don't want to do that, if I was going to uh, pencil it in, right, I'm thinking, okay, the, the, the color or the, the lighting There would be a shadow underneath here, right? And then maybe there would be. Then a line like so, and then. So I have to decide how much. Right. Mm -hmm. And then all these interior lines conform to the to the rhythm the flow now some might go all the way through and then maybe you know there's more shadow there right Mike, this is a great question. I want to throw up real fast. Okay, go ahead because I can't see anything. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Eternity asks: Is it important to cast a character's hair? Like, are you always thinking, "Oh, this looks like Zoe Deschanel"? Or I, I, yeah, I, I, I think that that looking at a real person definitely helps. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely helps if you're looking at a real person um, and really doing studies of hairstyles. One of the things that um, is very important is to understand how the hairstyle works, right? I mean, if you're drawing Blondie, right. right? Like her flapper cut. Yeah. Right. Or you're doing, you know the standard manga <laughs> hair, right? Which is something like this, yeah. right? It's still, it's coming out from the root. It's going now. Now you see some people really do this super the, the, the detail. Turn, the turnip cut. <laughs> yeah, you know, where there's lots of, yeah, right? It's still describing the form. Sometimes they will cut, the, there will be no rendering in the, so any half tone, would be done in the color stage. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I would say that one of the things about a comic book character is that they have very distinctive hairstyles. Like, you know, Superman, you know, he's got your typical hero hair, clean cut, 40s, Mm -hmm. Right. Except he has the spit curl, the S. Yeah. Right. Peter Parker from Spider-Man in the comics anyway mm -hmm. had those two yeah he had the the like the the spider the spider mandibles yeah, he, had, <laughs> he, had, he, had, he had two you know and then at, at, in the 70s you know everybody had the long the longer mm -hmm. right so you want to try to give your your characters are very, especially the women, you want to give them a distinctive hair, hairstyle. But the best thing to do is to draw, is to look like in order to, to do her hair, I actually looked at, I was thinking, okay, I had looked at what the previous artist had done, Harold Ledoux, and I looked at what 
uh, Ed Barreto, who was the artist on the strip before me, did. Mm -hmm. Right. But I was not satisfied with the way the hair was working. It seemed like it wasn't it wasn't working for me. I couldn't really understand how they were building the hair. It seemed to be very inconsistent. So what I decided to do was to look at uh, like glamorous women that would be on those type of shows like Dallas or whatever. And so I picked Morgan Fairchild because she had that kind of flowy, glamorous mane that like a rich, you know, uh, so, you know, so you know. light type, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so I said, okay, great. You could you could pick, you know, Joan Collins or mm -hmm. so yeah. So you could look at Zoe Deschanel or any actress. And the great thing, I mean, I do that for all the characters in Judge Parker. Yeah. Right. I would look at somebody and would say, Oh, I like this person's face structure, or I like this person's hair, and then I would do what I just did here. I would do studies of that person's hair, yeah. right? Like if I was going to draw uh, Nettie, all right, you have to figure out how to draw that character consistently. And one of the hard things about doing a like if you're doing Blondie, it's pretty straightforward, or Charlie Brown, or anything like that. It's a very iconographic style. But if you're drawing something that's more realistic, and of course, their hairstyles change over time, right? The old cartoons, the Bigfoot stuff, as they would call it, they never change their hairstyles. They have the same hairstyle in like 2021, or 2021, that they had in like 19, 1920. But if I was going to draw Nettie, you know, she had this, um, she had this sort of peekaboo mm -hmm. on one side. So her hair would come down on one side and go over. And she has a softer face, not as, mm -hmm. as angular, right? So it all, again... Even if I was drawing something that was an anime style or, you know, something that's more realistic soap opera comic book style, I'm thinking I'm using the same principles. So she has, so there's this hair going around the other side, right? This hair going around this side. And I think about the pieces, right? Mm-hmm. And I tend to try to draw these interesting sensual shapes for the hair that flows. So an S, you know, or, or an arc, you know, as opposed to, you know, you could do something like a C if they were like head bangs. So you might actually say C, C, C. Part mm -hmm. of it is making that stroke. Or S, S. So I think she has a lot of S's in her hair. And then, of course, it goes back over her shoulder. So this, I try to make the, the shape as strong and as simple as possible, even if I want to put the luscious feathering rendering on it. I try to make the shape as strong as possible because then I can put, and then I'm thinking, right, where is that, where is that crown? This is the most important one because this really helps to describe the turning. So I can actually do it like Mike Rowingo would do stuff like this. Mm-hmm where he would not, he didn't do a lot of this, right? Like Frazetta, where he was doing a lot of little rendering. He would keep it more graphic. Right. Right, so I could do it with, I could make this very graphic. And maybe you just, you know, you put a little bit of, to break up the, break up the waves.
right? So right here, where it starts to go up, maybe I would have another one. But now we go down, get the shadow underneath the neck, and then maybe you would have another. Maybe I would have another one here, right? So again, I could do like Charles Donna Gibson, you know, or somebody who liked to render, and I could put a lot of rendering in there, right? I could do a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Or I could keep it very simple and very graphic, but the principle is what you're trying to, to understand, is how to make sure the hair comes out of the top of the head, Mm -hmm. How you think of this is in layers, like you're laying on one layer and then another layer. You know, it's not like spaghetti, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, think the, I think the bands thing is probably like the biggest, like, eye opening moment of your tutorial. It's like thinking about, like, it, it, it sounds great on paper to say, think about the, the hair as shapes. And like, but to think of them as, you know, kind of like sections yes. that you kind of lay down, right? Because I think a lot of people just kind of like make hair, right? Like, just like it's like wheat or it's like you said, spaghetti. Like there's like a pile of spaghetti on top of somebody's head. But right. Of, mm -hmm. Right. So you think about it, you know, look at pictures of hair. You know, somebody might have a lot of waves. Somebody yeah. might have a... You know, somebody might have a lot of uh, a lot of curls, right? Somebody may and uh, have very curly hair. Hey, right? Mike, I want to stop you and ask uh, Eternity's question because it might uh, uh, change your next drawing. So, Eternity asks, "How would you know where to place light on super curly hair like Perez's Wonder Woman or Burns' She-Hulk?" Okay, so your light's coming this way. Let's say you have a uh, curls. You've got to put the little curls in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? So I'm thinking, okay, how long is this curl? So if I had very super curly hair, then for each curl, You're going to have a dark, then you're going to have the highlight of the curl. Then you're going to have, as you go down the curl. Now, sometimes as the curl comes back up, you might have another highlight. Mm -hmm. So, again, you, if you draw your guideline across, and you just have to do some studies, mm -hmm. right? But this is the principle, right? Mm -hmm. The principle is if there's a curl, you're going to have one. If it's a short curl, you're only going to have one peak, mm -hmm. right? Just like a wave, like a ribbon, right? Think of it as like a ribbon, right? Mm -hmm. You're only going to have one highlight on a short And then when this reflects back up on a longer ribbon, you know, mm -hmm. uh, let me see here. I might. Uh, 
let's see if we could find some here. So there, see that's mm -hmm. very curly. Yeah, right, 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 right. But all the peak of each curl, you have a highlight. Highlight, this is a ribbon. So think of that ribbon going around. Some ribbons are longer, some ribbons are shorter. Mm -hmm. So that's how you would that's how you would do it. Gotcha. Like look at she's got much more curly hair. Wow. That's so you can see yeah. with each peak, each peak of each ribbon of each wave, there's a highlight. Mm -hmm. Right here, this hair is less complex than this. Right. Right. So you've got more peaks, more ribbons. And in the middle of each ribbon, the top of the form, you've got the highlight. And here this, you only have one. And this only works, Mike, if you have constructed the hair as as its own form. Right, like like you said, like it would just look like a helmet if you just drop that on top of her head. There, there would be no way that you could figure out those light sources if you weren't follow, right? If you weren't following the pattern, yeah. right? Right. If you're not following the form, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, the best thing to do really is to not draw. I mean, you can do some studies of comics to get the the principle down, but really what you should do is to look at real hair and do studies of that because that will really inf reinforce, right? Because these are, these are stylizations, super stylizations of the, of the concept, right? Mm -hmm. But if you look at, you know, if you look at the, uh, at the, like those photos I was showing you, um, then you'll really you'll really get it you know that's that's great man um hold on a second Let me see if I can um and uh carl carla said and we're going to wrap up but uh mama carla asked about braids like you and i and i said in the chat that i think the same rules apply but you think of the braids which is almost a little simpler to, to, to envision that they're kind of like long cylinders, right? In rows that the light right. is going to hit uniformly. This, the principle is the same as it would be on the, the little curl, right? Because a braid is a series of little bubbles, right? Mm -hmm. The hair is, is braided into little bubbles. You know, you could also draw it very graphically and have no highlights at all on them. Like we're looking at Patterson or somebody like Frank Miller. He doesn't do a lot of rendering of hair. You could simply break it down <coughs> to a shape. But the principle of drawing a sphere and lighting a sphere or half a sphere is the same principle that you would use for, for anything. Uh, and just for people who asked in the chat, and I think this is a nice little plug, uh, uh, Mike's article he was referencing, one of them was from Draw Magazine, issue 21, with Dan Panosian on the cover. And we had a really fantastic conversation with Dan last year, uh, which you can find in our archives on YouTube, I believe, or on our Facebook, one of the two. So, yeah, it's, all these back issues are worth you picking up and getting a full set. Yeah, so I, I to me the main the, the main points are what is the style that you're working in? Are you working in a cartoony style? Are you working in something that would look like in like again like the the blondie style or something that's like an anime or a manga style where you're not doing a lot of rendering then it becomes really important to do strong shape um, and design, but the principle is still the same. The highlighting, the, the you at least doing the crown highlight at the top of the head. You see that all the time in uh, anime and and in because you can't do a lot of rendering. You mm -hmm. can't do a lot. You you can't do a lot of rendering. So so uh, get some. You know the internet's full of great photos. I like black and white photos because coloring. Or what they call local color, the actual like this, this, this is blue, right? So that's right. local color. Right. Of the the 
color can actually confuse you. If you see it in black and white, you just see the value, and it's easier to understand the form of especially things like hair in black and white. You know, if you're looking at something that's the person has red hair or some weird blue hair or something like that, it's harder to understand the form in the beginning to study uh, if it's in color because you might get caught up in the way the coloring was done as opposed to what the form is. Yeah. Cool. Well, Mike, that was fantastic. That was a really thorough demo. I appreciate you and I appreciate all the homework you did. I'm, I'm feeling a little short short to class. I feel like I left something at home uh, for mine, but I really enjoyed that. No, and, you know, you did, yeah, you did it. You did a great job. I, I think the 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 point overall for this whole thing is that it's self-study. Yeah. If you're interested in something, really put the time in into studying. The thing about cartooning is Every cartoonist is built upon something that a previous cartoonist did all the way back. So if you like some anime or manga styles, those are built upon the top of the last hundred years of people cartooning. Yeah. You know, yeah. the same principles that somebody was using in 1929 or 1907 to render hair it's the same principles that we are using today, the same idea, the same form, idea of form, right? Line mm -hmm. is line, form is form. Everyone can put a little bit of a style on it, but mm -hmm. your style is the expression of your knowledge. So all those examples we, sh we were looking at today are the expression of the artist's knowledge. So you want to put that information in. You know, if you sat there and you took, Two months, you got a sketchbook, and you did some practices. You you drew some studies of an artist you liked, and then you drew for some photographs and tried to apply something that you learned from that artist from observation, right? You may find that you may something will just something will click, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. you don't want to just be a um, a dead mimic of somebody else. And the other thing about learning to draw, and we all study other people, and I study stuff all the time. You also want to study life because you want to have your own observations in there. You don't want to just be like a Frankenstein of mm -hmm. other people's ideas. You know, I saw somebody the other day on Twitter actually posted a very important thing. I can't remember the artist now, but they were putting up a bunch of uh, things like we were doing tonight. And they had the typical draw the person using the the the, uh, the, flat the pipes the and the the, the, the the pipes and the the balls and the side the the the, uh, the the crash test dummy, mm -hmm. and the the illustration was a woman sitting with her arm, and how the arm swells out. Now, if you just drew the crash test dummy, you wouldn't get that sexy shape mm -hmm. of the shoulder swelling out you get that from observation right right so you can you can study a book you can study all these great books you can study all the luminous books but you still also have to look at life so you go ah that's what that person was that's what they were trying to, yeah. to the get light, the light bulb moment oh <laughs> that's, that's great right. well well, we're going to start wrapping it up. Thank you guys for hanging out with the home team. Jamar and Mike, uh, Pencil to Pencil is the broadcast every Wednesday, 8 p.m. Uh, EST will be here. Um, I'm going to give a plug for our next guest. Uh, on uh, the 27th, Mike, January's almost over. <laughs> you believe that? Yes, I do. Uh, our next guest is going to be uh, uh, an amazing video game uh, uh, artist, Danny Williams. Uh, you can find him online. He goes by Point Pusher. It's magnificent work, and he's probably worked on your favorite video game. Um, uh, uh, I was really excited about booking Danny because um, video game art 
is something we kind of touched on when Mike Caprati was one of our guests. Uh, but Mike is a, a traditional illustrator uh, who does video game stuff. But uh, Danny is kind of from the from the inside coming out, right? So you know he does a lot of uh, visual effects for video games and uh, 3D rendering and things like that. He's a fantastic, fantastic artist. So I can't wait to talk to him next Wednesday. Um, so I hope to see all of you soon. Uh, there's some nice thank yous. Matt Ringo says, thanks, guys. That was great. Uh, also, we got a couple of new people like our, our, our good friend EJB. Thanks for the stream. Lots of good information. I hope you subscribe and smash that alarm so you get updates when we go uh, and talk about our next guest. All right, cool. So in uh, Turn of Teens back home, thanks. Thanks. Um, Mike, I had a lot of fun. Uh, I enjoy us doing these. And we said at one point that we were going to try to do one of these like every so episodes, right? Yeah, like, 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 once, like once a month. So if there's a subject that you would like to see us cover, yes, tell us. Write us and tell us. Mm -hmm. Or we'll just draw what we want. That's right. I'm going to draw more pie <laughs> next time. All right, guys. So you guys have a, a great rest of your week. Uh, look for more updates on the YouTube channel from us. Uh, look for maybe some more process videos from Mike. I may do an ashy stream uh, maybe uh, at the end of the week. Uh, and we're going to try to push more content on the YouTube channel. So this doesn't grow unless you signal boost tell your friends you got to share the love don't don't keep it to yourself don't hoard it you spread the love all right so let's have a let's have a great night for our best bud brett blevins who's uh smiling down on us from a, a dis from his disembodied head uh i've been jamar nicholas that's my good bud mike manley we'll see you next time and don't see forget next time. wash those curvy hands well that was a good one mike <laughs> <laughs> Be careful out there. See you next time.